Hello, you wonderful people, and welcome to another episode of Not Too Comic Book. This being a show where it's about TV shows that are adaptations of comic books. For today's episode, I'm going to talk about the latest episode of DC's Legends of Tomorrow. A great episode. A lot of really interesting things were done in this episode, so let's break it down. I really like episodes like this where it's like, oh, let's see what this particular character's been up to the entire time. Because basically, it's kind of what I thought... Um, catching the previews uh, last time, just glimpses of it, but I was like, okay, so it seems like we're going to basically be dealing with what Astra's been up to for the past three episodes while the Legends were off doing their thing, because she literally hasn't popped up since episode one, but uh, basically it's her trying to live life, she's excited, like, ah, I'm going to be on top of everything, but living a human life, a normal human life, isn't the easiest thing. To be fair, she's grown up in hell, uh, plus, time works a little differently. She kind of talks about it later on because it's like, oh, like my records say I'm only 15. It's like, well, time works a little differently. So she ate because who knows how long she was in hell. Like it's not – she's probably like what? In her mid to late 20s, if not like early 30s. I don't even know how the actress who plays uh, Astra is. I mean that doesn't always translate either because sometimes actors might be a little bit older than their characters anyway. But – so she was spending quite a few time, bit of time in hell, but who knows, like, because hell works a little differently, she, what could have been, like, 10 years could actually be 100 years, because, you know, it's, you know, hyper, almost like the hyperbolic time chamber, like, rules working like that, but, uh, yeah, she doesn't have actually any money, she couldn't get a job, it's like, oh, we have no Wi-Fi, the fact is her cell phone is still connected to hell service, so it's like she needs to go to hell to get a better reception, um... It's like, oh, the bills need to be paid because the lights go off. It shows how irresponsible John is. To be fair, I guess nowadays he's usually kicking it with the legend, so upkeep on the house is never his top priority. To be fair, he's never, because I think it's also stemming from the fact is John's never had to worry about someone else's well-being. It's just always like, you know, he's a little selfish by nature anyway, but it's like I never had to, like, helping out the legends and stuff like that, sure. It also plays a little bit into that aspect of, right, a lot of the heroes would come to know it's like, right, you, you're in secret bases and stuff like that, but it's like, what do you do for a living? You know, obviously, we bounce around that with Arrow just because it's like, well, we know what Oliver was doing some of the times, like, for, like, money, and eventually later on, different characters got jobs too, but it's like, yeah, like, what about everyone that works at Star Labs in The Flash? Like, what do they do for income? That's a big question that's just now, no, 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 don't worry about it. It almost makes you wonder, like, Falcon and the Winter Soldier opening up that pool of light. Wait, the Avengers don't get paid? It makes you wonder a lot of other shows going to start taking note of that. Because, like, we only know, like, a handful of superheroes that actually have, like, nine to five jobs. Barry has one. Um, I mean, Iris does because she's a reporter. Um, um, Ryan working at the bar. Uh, plus all the community, like, stuff she's doing, but, like, you know, just, like, a paying job, because I don't know if that necessarily pays, but, yeah, working at the bar, uh, Kara being a reporter, working for Catco, Jeff being a principal, so, like, there's, like, legitimate jobs and stuff like that, it's just kind of interesting, and then you get to the legends, they don't have jobs, it's like, why would they need jobs when their time, they literally live on the spaceship, it's their home, so it's like, you don't have to pay bills, and, like, Gideon makes them whatever they need, so it's like, you know, so it's something to think about, so none of the legends really have to deal with that, so she's actually the only one in the show that actually has to deal with, like, a regular life, especially because she decides she won't have nothing to do with the legends and their, like, misadventures, but, um, yeah, life is tough, especially when, um, you see John constantly popping in and out of the episode, uh, you know, helping deal with the respective things that they've kind of dealt with, at least for the past two episodes, because John was involved last episode. But we saw, like, uh, Zari still wearing the, like, burger outfit from uh, episode two. And in episode three, uh, John was dressed up, you know, from they were on that, uh, that uh, music show and stuff like that in episode three. So, love stuff like that. But obviously, we found Aleister Crowley. I'm assuming she was looking for stuff because she was going to sell it uh, to make some money. But then she comes across Alistair, which he was like, oh, he popped me up here. And then he ban banished me into this painting uh, because Alistair is the one we heard about earlier in the season who knows about aliens and stuff like that. He's the one that's actually looking for a fountain that he believes to be like connected to like some alien magic, which is interesting to know. Like not only are we getting aliens this season, we're getting alien magic potentially. That's a whole interesting um, aspect within itself. But um other than that, uh, really quickly, uh, you know, she, you know, ends up 
putting John inside of the painting because as I write, you weren't there to help me. Now I'm struggling. The fact is living life isn't that. No, especially because he was so like, wait, even magic is hard. Like, you know, it, you know, it's like he's saying life is hard and even magic's hard. And then he immediately uses magic for the, the most simplest non- non hardworking thing and that's to find some cigarettes it's like you don't know how douchey you come off in that moment but uh yeah she uh swaps him and now he's in john's body it's like oh i'm teaching you all this magic but obviously he teaches her like the beginning stuff which is like oh all this is just an illusion uh it very much like reminds me of like the order because they basically in that tv show on netflix they kind of use magic in the same regard of like oh yeah this is kind of an illusion granted that came with its side effect because like to be fair we've Everything showcases, oh, magic doesn't come without a price. Magic always has a price. That's kind of like the lesson to be learned across everything that's ever tackled magic. I mean, I think John, out of no, out of anyone, would know that better well, than anyone, you know? That you know, there's always a price to pay for something. But uh, she's kind of enjoying because she's feeling powerful again. Because she she references it. She's like, right, I like I had to, like I was that little girl. I had to claw my way up to being a queen, and now that's all been taken from me. She thought she could apply a lot of that to Earth, but it's like, nah. Like all the power she amassed means nothing on Earth now. Um, it does make you wonder, like, who's kind of like what's that like circumstances like down in hell? Like who's down there? Like who's potentially kind of running things? I don't think they've really answered that too much, but. Um, it's interesting because another aspect to think about is she did kind of have to grow up fast. So on some level, she is still kind of like a 15 year old girl who's just kind of, you know, trying to figure everything out. She can't doesn't have anyone to really rely on. She's supposed to have John, but he's not really there for her. Uh, but then obviously, you know, there's this spell to like take a soul and it's like oh you need one she's like i got christopher columbus i got this it's like no 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 it needs to be a living soul and it's like okay which also is kind of messed up to know oh you still carry souls around with you why but all you would have left those in hell i guess it's like oh you never know when the opportunity comes and you're going to need a soul so that's interesting but i love the fact is that it's like she's planning on taking the soul of her neighbor because well he's a racist piece of crap so who cares uh he kind of looked down upon me because he was like oh there's no way you lived in this neighborhood that she could be nothing more than help and it's like why is it because i'm tall is it because i'm dressed the way i am is it because i'm black and he's just like no 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 you won't get so aggressive with me and bloody blah, blah 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 acting super posh and everything like the most it, and not saying against anything to anyone that speaks posh or is kind of posh it's like this is the most entitled um old fuddy-duddy um type of posh uh, but i love that when the legends show up because it's like right like mix off of like you know um uh, kayla to find uh uh sarah so we're kind of stuck well we need somewhere to chill and everything and i love they're just all poking and prodding of like oh there's actually no food here it was like what's your wi-fi router um and then ultimately she turns them all into different things. The moment she did, I was like, oh, how very Beauty and the Beast, all of them being turned into different things. Which I guess on some level it kind of makes sense. Ava being the binder, Spooner being a fork, okay. Um, Nate being a block of cheese, I guess because he's so cheesy. Uh, Zari being not only a phone, a flip phone. The later on she was using a phone and I was like, did she actually use Zari to do that? And I think she did, maybe. Um... Berad is a, a, a candle, and um, that is uh, everybody, right? Yeah. Uh, it makes you wonder what Mick would have been. Because I think if Mick was here, he probably would have been the candle himself. Regardless, it's just, it's just something interesting to think about. But, um, yeah, just obviously very befitting of, like, their personality. Maybe that's why Spooner, because she asked, like, why was I a fork? I guess it's like, you would have expected me to be a spoon or something. Maybe that's supposed to be the irony behind it. But I think it's also because, like, you're pokey. Like, a, you know, it's like, oh, you're kind of almost like a spoon, but you got your sharp points. Maybe that's what it is. Did I just compare a fork and a, say that a fork is a spoon with a sharp points? Yes, I did. We're moving forward. Um, so, regardless. I mean, I guess the more appropriate thing would have probably turned her into a spork. Which, metal sporks are a thing. They're, I don't think they're common, but you can get them. Which is weird, because I'm just so used to, like, sporks from, like, KFC and stuff like that. Regardless, and those being plastic, yada, 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 tangents and all that. But, um, when the time came, uh, she was going to try and take his soul, but, like, everyone was, like, from the legends, it's kind of her subcon- like, her conscience, because being like, no, don't do it. It's like, oh, his soul's going to end up in hell. It's like, we're not worried about his soul, we're worried about yours, you know? And it's like... And eventually, they kind of wore it down. She's like, ah, get out of here. But then, uh, Alistair ends up 
taking the dude's soul anyway. And now, oh, I've got all this power. And then he proceeds to turn it into an animate, like basically a Disney animated movie. I'm like, this is amazing. Leave it up to Legends of Tomorrow. You can always count on it to get weird. It also, it, it filled me with the same satisfaction. I was trying to feel like, what does it remind me of? It reminds me of this, what I think is still my favorite episode of Supernatural. It's a Supernatural Scooby-Doo crossover episode. It reminded me of that. And I love that she suddenly busts into song being like, why am I singing? And just, I, I love it. It's so good. Um, it definitely feels like, it kind of like, I don't know what that I wonder who they got the like for the animation for this it's like you know and it's just it's it's so good and obviously she works with the legends each one of them doing their own thing um you even had Ava shooting out papers from her binder going pew 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 uh Spooner just stabbing him in the leg uh Nate turning turning into a steel piece of roll of cheese it was it just and then uh Berard burning him it's just like it was just amazing it was just so good all around oh yeah and uh zari like clipped his it cut down his ears with as a flip phone it was just like this is awesome i i was literally smiling the entire sequence i was like this is so good but um yeah he ends up like trapping them and sending her to the you know um the attic where he's gotten uh, John. And I love it. It's so good because she's kind of doing like the quote unquote like princess, the stereotypical, oh, woe is me. What am I supposed to do type of thing? And John's going to teach her like, he's like, right, you can do the cleansing spell. It's like, and it's something your mom made. And am I being crazy or is that stuff just straight out? I've, as someone who's not, I've not read a Constantine comic book, but I'm like, that it doesn't look just like stuff. That looks like that stuff they just straight took from the comic, but those are like probably like panels and shot straight from the comic book. I was like, especially the artistic style is like, oh, I guess, you know, because the comic books are darker, uh, just Constantine stories typically are. So, I mean, I'd expect a lot of that stuff we saw, probably what we'd get from like the Constantine reboot that's supposed to be coming to HBO Max. Um, I guess something of like that vein, just kind of a little darker because it will have the benefit of being on H well, HBO Max will allow it to be darker. Very much like the other DC shows like, you know, Doom Patrol, Titans, uh, Swamp Thing, and, um, you know, so I just thought that was so interesting. And it's like, right. And it's like, because she had found that uh, music book from her mom earlier, but she's like, right, it was for John because she never learned how to read music. And she's like, oh my God, I found the, the uh, yes, but the cleansing spell is a song. And she's like, but I don't know how to read music. I was like, whoa, suddenly I know how to, how's that possible? And he, John's like, every, and, you know, every uh, animated princess knows how to sing. And it's like, yep. <laughs> and they end up doing the song and... It's, it's supposed to cleanse the way, and oh, it's just so good. And I love that it's legitimately putting him to sleep. And then at one point, he grows really large and eats her. It like it very much reminded me of oh god, what's his face from season three? The season three's main antagonist when they had uh, Bebo versus him. It kind of reminded me of that a little bit in certain regards, just like him transforming like that, but also like him going to sleep and then bam, back to reality. I was like, that whole sequence is so dope. But obviously they kick home dude out of there and it's like, yeah, just go. And she's like, this is, these are my friends. This is my house. Get out, you know, but, uh, the cleansing spell went a lot further than just stripping Alistair. It stripped John of his powers, but he's like, Hey, uh, don't worry. I got to start from the beginning as well. And she's like, cool, cool, cool. So it's like, for him, he apologized. He's like, right, because I was so caught up in my own world. And for her, it's like, right, I didn't think life was going to be this hard. But now, because I'm going to have to start fresh, we're going to be, you know, uh, fellow students and stuff like that, you know? But the look on John's face makes it seem like it's a lot worse than he was making it seem like. It's probably, it, it, it seems like we might be hinting to he might not have magic ever again because it was supposed to be like a failsafe if John ever steeped too close and got to, like, especially because he was already probably doing some stuff that obviously as we saw, so it's probably meant to take his magic away permanently. There might not be a means of reversing it. It might be gone forever. So this fountain that is alien magic might actually be his only means of ever getting magic back. So he's probably going to teach her. So he's probably, because he knows, like, if she finds out, like, oh my God, your magic is gone, she'd probably feel guilty and he doesn't want her to. It's like, you know, this is a body. He attacked. I knew what the cleansing spell was going to do, but I don't think it just took him to the base level where it's like, okay, I'm going to have to learn magic again, which maybe that is the case. Like, everything he's ever known is kind of gone. All the years of magic he practiced, all that experience is gone, and he's starting from the bottom, so that could be what, what the soul and look is about, but it could also just be 
Nah, I legitimately have to start, like, I'm legitimately out of magic, so it's not even just a starting from square one type of thing, so. Uh, but like, it's just legitimately a fun, fun ride. I just, I love that aspect. So, along with that, we get on the other side of things where we have Sarah. Uh, I've been noticing that a lot, too. Like, Katie Lotz is directing quite a few episodes. She's done, like, a handful. Of, I don't know how many she's done in total, but I just noticed it from them. I was like, oh, this is directed by Katie Lotz. I feel like I should take notice of that more, especially because, like, uh, I, I meant to bring it up in one episode because I know David Ramsey, John Diggle himself, uh, directed, uh, not this past episode, but I want to say it was episode seven, Men of Steel, of uh, Superman and Lois, that episode. I believe he, yeah, he directed that one, if I'm not mistaken. So I was like, oh, Dave, I just forgot to bring it up during review. I, I meant to note that, but, you know, it's just, it's so dope. It's just be like, ah, that's so sick. I, should, I feel like I should, you know, take more notice of that type of stuff, regardless. Um, we meet Bishop, and it's just like, oh, you're the one that's behind on this. He's like, well, you're making me sound like a supervillain, but that's not what this is all about. He's talking about he's going to save humanity by starting to save Sarah because he's got the antidote. And I'm like, what do you mean you're going to save Sarah? I didn't get it. And we also find out, like, because I, I was, like, wondering what Bishop's whole deal is. And I was like, yeah, why are the Ava clones here and everything? So he is from the future, basically far off future, where, well, further in the future where humanity has basically led to like earth not being what it's supposed to be so he's come back in time to try and save it like he's actually the one who created the ava clone so it's like it never crossed my mind to think about oh who actually did make them because we've been dealing with that since when did ava find out she was a clone season two no i think that was no it was season three because that's when the um the time uh bureau first popped up so season three it might even been season four she found out i don't remember it might have been a season. It might have actually been season one because season three is when she got introduced. I think season four is when we found out. I believe. No, no, no. It had to be in season three. Maybe she. No, she was introduced in season two, wasn't she? I don't remember now. I'm, I'm confusing myself because like she found out the truth about herself before uh, Rip died because he dies at the near the end of season three, doesn't he? If I'm not, if I'm not mistaken, because he sacrificed himself. So I think it had to be like sometime during season three, she found out the truth about herself. Tangents and all that aside, uh, but he's the one who made the clones and he puts on that show and everything of like, because basically he's trying to, like the reason why he's got all these different aliens captured, because basically he wants to create like a, a new species to like, we're going to go out to the stars as what he's excavating, like, oh, we're going to find a new world and to basically make it so that humans can survive. He's taking like kind of the best part to all this different alien DNA and going to put in humans, which... Sarah's like, that's a terrible idea. You can't turn people into monsters like you did, you know, uh, Amelia Earhart. I was like, oh, that's interesting. So that legitimately was Amelia Earhart, which is sad because that means she legitimately was turned into a monster. It's like, oh, man, that's crazy. It's like, oh, that's sad. She was kidnapped from time. That's why she disappeared to be turned into a monster, an, an alien. I was like, oh, that's that's sad. And Because that, not even just being turned into an alien, like a hybrid monster and everything. I was like, oh, that's that's super depressing. But he's like, no one gets it right on their first try. He also kind of makes Sarah kind of discount. He's trying to discount like, oh, like, I get it. You fell in love with your a Ava, but it's like, they're all clones. I basically programmed them and stuff like that. Now, I think this is going to, you know, make Sarah. It might not. We might be entering depressing territory when those paths eventually cross. He might be able to control like Ava. It's like, oh, I made you the type A type of person that you are like, you know that you're so like controlling and bossy and stuff like that she's like ava's not bossy it's like who are you kidding ava is extremely bossy she, but she's all very particular but you too like you're very laissez-faire bossy yet laissez-faire and she's just bossy and just kind of controlling but you two bounce that, that dynamic is what kind of works she's a yin to your yang you know type of thing but um i think we're going to get to the point where it's like when they meet up he's going to be able to control her because it's like and, he, and then you're going to, like, make you wonder, and I'm sure maybe this might even be something for Ava's, like, wait, is anything I felt even real? I mean, because she already dealt with this in the past, but obviously, like, the C word has been kind of like a non-starter of, like, no, 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 don't say the C word, we're, we're not about to bring up the, you know, which is so interesting, because obviously it's like, there is no hashtag clone club when it comes to this, but it is so interesting, because, like, when you have Orphan Black, they, like, embrace it, like, Ava's like, no, 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 don't, don't, don't say the C word around me, you know, it's, a, it's just interesting to think about. I never actually thought about it, because, like, I was wondering, I think someone had brought Tatiana Mislani up, uh, recently, and I was, like, geeking out about it, because I totally geek out anytime, like, Tatiana Mislani is brought up, because she's, like, like, the best, she's awesome, um, 
because I like I'm an, I'm a huge like Orphan Black fan, and she just like nailed that on so many roles. Once again, just let me get my nerdiness out. Allison and Donnie, favorite couple. They're so damn good. I definitely need. I don't think I've added them to one of my favorite fictional couples. I need to. All the shenanigans they got up to. Oh, they're so so good. Regardless, ten. My, my tangent's over. But um, yeah, that's where like ha why hashtag Clone Club was kind of in my my mind because someone like it was actually a little while back, but it just it was just floating in my mind. Regardless, the fact of the matter is. Um, I think that's potentially where we're going to go. Getting back to my point, I'm so sorry that I went on that huge tangent. That, like, he's going to be able to control her and make her maybe undermine herself and think, like, no, maybe I'm just a clone. Like, maybe do I have any control? He might have special words. It's like, oh, to make any clone become what he needs them to be. So, which is sad because she proposed to Sarah and everything. Because he, he's even saying, like, oh, the fact of the matter is you fell in love with my clone and I needed you because he basically needs someone to train humanity to have the fighting spirit. So, basically, whatever creates he's making from humanity he needs her to be that's why he's been keeping an eye on her for so long he's like yeah i've kind of followed her entire life i mean he's from the future so he has probably like all the records of like everything that sarah's ever done he's like yeah the woman who can't be killed is like she has been killed you know but i guess it's like well the lazarus pit brought her back and then there's the whole situation of like her becoming like oh she's a paragon of destiny and she was kind of like during season three she got that I forgot what it was because there was different ones, but it was kind of like, was it like the totem of death or something like that she had gotten? So she kind of had a little bit of control over like death. That was a whole thing. Like, so I, I guess it makes sense. Like no matter what, sh I mean, hell, let's not face it. Like, well, I mean, to be fair, I was like I'm about to say the whole season two thing. It's like with the Spear of Destiny. It's like, well, she was the last one standing amongst the legends. Granted, she got that version of Sarah got erased because she was a paradox, you know, and that, you know, so there's that whole situation but like yeah it's just interesting because it's not like she can't die it's not like she's immortal or anything like that it's just uh, she's the badass that she is and uh circumstances have led her to be where she is right now despite death and everything so but uh she's actually and also he's like all right so make sure you catch up on the 15 seasons of why no or no no Earth. i was like wait what and they even played the theme song which i was like what whoever is behind this i wonder is it like like, is it some of the writers or producers or something? Like, I wonder if someone, on, people on the show can, like, connect it to, like, some of the people behind the scenes, like, whether it be, like, writers or producers, or connect it to, like, Winona Earth, the reason why that was. I'm assuming that was probably written well before, like, it was announced. Because it wasn't announced until, like, a little before, like, uh, Winona Earth returned for its final episode. So it's like, hey, this is going to be the final episode. So uh, this had to be written well before it was like, you know, announced and stuff like that. But it's just kind of like, it's a funny bit, but also kind of a sad bit because like Winona's not getting 15 seasons. It got four. But still, at this song, and like I said, they're playing the theme song and everything. It's like, and even the Ava, uh, Nurse Ava being like, season two is my favorite. And it's like, so it's like, are you a Erper and stuff? I was like, oh my God, we're going in on this. And she's like talking about way hot. I was like, no, 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 this ain't some like casual stuff. This is some deep Winona stuff you're saying right now. Like someone on this, sh connected to this show is a big Winona Erp fan. But as a big Winona Erp fan myself, I loved it. But either like either they're connected to the show and just making these winks and nods and why not over. It's like it's so dope, dude. I love it. And even Sarah being like, oh yeah, like season two is definitely my favorite. It's like the show found its footing, which I'm like, ah, shut up. Like the show found out what it wanted to be and stuff like that. I'm like, shut up. I love this inside baseball stuff. Uh, but part of me also wonders, could that be like a wink and nod to Legends of Tomorrow? Because I think the same thing could be said. I've said it time and time again. You compare where Legends is now compared to like season one, it's like night and day. Not like season one was bad, but it's still like, in no shape or form. I think season one is great, but it's like, tonally these are very different shows like i think it leaned more into the dramatic size and now like the show is just like well, yeah we can be dramatic but we're also going to be like super crazy super out super out there super wacky um i want to say season two is kind of where the show kind of found its footing season three is where it kind of really was like nah this is what legends of tomorrow is you either here for the ride or you're getting off the ride and i've been on the ride ever since i've been on the ride since season one but like i said just tonally like i think season two probably is where they really hit their stride i think um, kind of figure out what they wanted the show to kind of be. So I don't know if that was just them making a weekend nod, not only to Wynonna or, or, or Earp, but like maybe it kind of applied. Yeah, I did just kind of say that weird. Wynonna Earp. I kind of like Earp, 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 Earp. Uh, But, you know, maybe they were kind of saying that about themselves as well. But the moment Sarah's trying to appeal to Ava, being like, you know, you have your own soul, you're a human, like help me escape. And she's like, no, I can't do that. Um, 
But then, like, she comes back and helps and everything. I'm like, nah, she's not helping you. It's a trap. And it turns out to be the case. Like, it's like, oh, he just needed to find the ship because, yeah, the aliens aren't up there. I was about to say, like, not only are they in deep space, they're scattered across uh, all of time, but he's already got their DNA. Like, he's like, I'd rather have live subjects to work on, but, like, it's a backup to have, like, all their DNA. So, obviously, Sarah kicks butt and then snaps Bishop's neck, but then she gets darted, and then she wakes up. I was like, okay. Because at first I was like, when she snapped his neck, are we gonna, I was like, are we going to find out this was all a simulation or something? No, uh, in that moment she wakes up and Bishop's alive and he's like, yeah, we're kind of connected. So like, oh, like intertwined or something like that, un uh, inseparable or something like that. So I was like, I guess in that moment, like he injected like his consciousness into her. Like, so now they're kind of stuck together type of situation when like, I'm assuming that's what he's kind of referencing. So very, very interesting developments on both sides of this episode. I am very, very excited to ultimately see where all of this ends up taking us going forward into the next episode. It is interesting to know Bishop, because like Bishop's end goal isn't what I thought it was going to be. Like I said, I thought it was going to be like a DBZ thing of like, uh, oh, more so DV super where it's like, yeah, you're going to fight for the sake of your own universe. You know, which is interesting since they already kind of have because of crisis. But still, like, I was thinking, like, maybe it's going to be something like, you know, the uh, battle of champions across all the different planets. But it's like, that's not the case. It's like, no, nah, I'm trying to make a new uh, species of beings and I need humans to be like, I need Sarah, the badass that she is, to train them um, to have that fighting spirit she does. So that's, and he, you know, he's been watching her for a long time. So, uh, like I said, it's going to be interesting to see where all this takes us going forward. But uh, really, that's all I'm going to talk about. So the next time we meet, be happy, be safe, live life to the fullest, and enjoy it. Good day and goodbye.